Okay, we're kicking off this season two of Masters of Privacy with Milton Pedraza. Milton is the CEO of the Luxury Institute, and he's also a private investor in some of the personal data store or personal information management system startups that many in the My Data community are familiar with. If you're not familiar with My Data, don't worry, we will cover it at some point. In any case, he's a frequent guest speaker at Columbia University. He's a recognized entrepreneur. And a recent investment of his is Data Lucent, which is very pertinent to the discussion we will have today. So without further ado, let's get started. Milton, welcome to Masters of Privacy. When did you decide that there was an opportunity in building something like this? Okay, I would say about three years ago, we were at a conference and we heard somebody talking about privacy in relation to how it was being exploited and how people were at risk. And so we began with Katie and our team to investigate privacy. But what that led us to was to see that there was a personal data economy opportunity. And so we saw Tim Berners-Lee and the people from Warwick University, Dr. Eng, people like you and many others around the country and around the world, mostly around the world, I would say not so many in America. Although there were some lawyers in Silicon Valley like Richard Witt, the Need to Be Alliance, we found out about my data. We found out about DigiMe. And so we began to put pieces together from all these illustrious people that there was an opportunity for data, which is the fuel of the 21st century, to be controlled, maybe not owned, controlled and licensed by people. That essentially that people have personal data rights, just like they have other types of human rights, and that they are data generators and creators and that that is a copyrightable and a licensable asset for people. And that that could help to eradicate inequality and many other problems because now you have the ability to earn from your, not so much your data, but the insights from your data. Because we like to say that, yeah, when a, when a, um, when a bank, the, the bank wants to know that the data uh, from which they're calculating your credit score is authentic and verifiable, but they don't need all the numbers theoretically, they could go into your device, the algorithm calculates the, algor the uh, credit score, and that's the only part that they need. So we saw that it's not raw data that is valuable. It is the insights that are actionable and that can help, of course, companies, but can in some way come back and help you because now you have a mirror into your life that can be very private for your eyes only and benefit you, maybe change your habits. Okay, that's, uh, that's very interesting. So when we do not talk about granular data and sort of the specific personal data, but we talk about the insights that come out of it, those insights in aggregate, they don't even have to be overlapping with privacy rights. Well, there may be some insights that I want to remain private and retain private. And it depends on who I'm, I'm dealing with. If I'm dealing with a consumer goods company, they have no reason to have access to my medical and my financial data, right? And other intimate data that is not related to that. When I'm dealing with my doctor, I don't know, maybe my dietary consumption of goods <laughs> because maybe I don't eat very well. But let's just say that you can uh, portion off different verticals of data and you can combine them sometimes. Like with medical, you might want your consumption of food. And so do you need those transactions? Uh, you need amounts of consumption, you need exercise, you need all the metrics on your body, you need uh, maybe habits, places where you go, along with all your medical, quote, medical records. So I think that we haven't explored yet what the combination and recombination of data can do for humanity. I mean, we're, this is early days. So I would say that, yes, that some ins many insights that pertain are relevant to that appropriate entity that I'm dealing with, whether it's a hospital or a bank, or a luxury company, or a social platform, those insights, I think we're going to have to become more selective over time is what we provide that is relevant for you. But then what is not relevant, I can control and I can keep to myself or, or save it for the entity that for whom it is relevant. Into the specifics of your, of, of, I don't know your, but the initiative that, that you are. Uh... Yeah, it's Data Lucent, which is a company I invested in. Uh, guys who are far smarter than I am and who thought of a lot more things than I did. And you're also an investor in Digital.me. Can we say that? Digital.me, yes, yeah. Digital.me. Digital so 
In the spectrum of different models, because I understand you've been looking at many companies, would you say this is sort of the low-hanging fruit in terms of the opportunity for for brands to leverage transparency, agency? Yes, yes. So I believe the long-term opportunity is edge AI, right? Uh, when, when, the, when the microprocessors on the phones, when the 5G becomes a reality, because right now it's being sold, but it's smoke. When uh, the, data, uh, the data science community and the data community, when all the, when all the elements that can create edge AI converge, right? Then you can, get, you can walk into a store and get an instant, super relevant, either service or offer because the, you know, the AI, the data and the AI converts on your device to do something very special for you. That I think is a few years away. So for now, what the data Lucent does is to uh, create the consent mechanisms of technology, uh, create the, uh, the processing of the data to make it more uh, viable, rich, able to be analyzed and combine it, protect the consumer as if it were an edge eye edge AI uh, uh, server, meaning they have triple protection. They have the, think of it as a, they call it a data lake, which is the main server. Yeah. And then think of Lago Maggiore where there are little islands. So each island belongs to a brand. And within each brand, there's an individual personal data store for each consumer that has agreed, who has agreed to license the data. So if, if a uh, hacker tries to penetrate it, it's almost as if they had to hack into all the individual devices when we had the edge AI decentralized world. But this is in a, still in a central server. It's just that everything is kept individualized and it's anonymized and it's encrypted. And only the insights go out to the brand, not the data. All right. Okay. That's very useful. So thank you. So to process that in my head with Solid and Digimi and all the pieces that we've seen out there. Yeah. So the difference here is the promise that I never saw quite delivered by blockchain-based, edge-based pods. Mm -hmm. And this would be sort of cloud-based pods in a way that could be akin to Inwrapped today in terms of the pod. Yes, and, and what uh, DataSwift does uh, and others, right? Yes. So it's not that we think we're going to be the only one. It's that we think we're going to be a player in the field and then remember, Sergio, that uh, we believe internally in Data Lucent, and we just had this conversation the other day with six of us, that it's not the technology that's going to protect us, okay? People will find ways, innovative ways to figure out how to do consent and data transfer, and they'll figure out how to do uh, the analytics. And so the real game in the future is who do you trust the most? Yeah. Do you trust apex to take care of you now when we say that we say who does the consumer trust the most in the individual and who does the brand trust the most because there's two players this is a platform so it's a chicken and egg and we have to be unimpeachable in the way we treat the humans and the brands and that is not in conflict so then you've got these parts and the difference that i see with other things i've seen before is that because you have a purpose that is well defined at the outset, which is that brands will be able to leverage data that people are downloading by exercising their portability rights yes. or the feature to, to, to download your Facebook data and whatnot. The initial purpose, I mean, in the future, who knows where, what other types of data we'll be able to aggregate for individuals. But yes, I mean, it's the easiest one because obviously you said portability, but it's also the richest among the data, right? True. So, so then you put that data, if I'm a user, uh, then I would get my data in that place. And then difference being is that you speak of a license and you know, because I've told you before that I am, I get very confused by the idea of a license. But if we're talking about the insights that come out of it and data is anonymized, then I do not see that much of a conflict. How does that work? So once as, a, as an individual, I have downloaded my data, put it there, then I've agreed for certain brands, I guess, one by one to each. Well, the way we're going to start is, let's say you are BMW or Gucci or another brand, usually the big brands. They will send a campaign invitation to you as a customer. 
only the customers, maybe the prospect list, but right now we're talking only with customers. And I invite you, Sergio, and I provide you with an, a, a, an award. Let's say I'm a hotel, because that's an easy one. So I say, Sergio, in exchange for you taking the time to download your Facebook data into your device, and then immediately uploading it into the Apex server with all the protections, with consent, you will, and providing it directly to me, let's say Hotel Company X, I will give you seven free room nights this year. And for every year that you give me data, we update it, I will give you seven free room nights or some other, or I'll upgrade you to the presidential suite, or I will provide you free breakfast at the club, or I will provide you a free cabana, blah, blah, blah. Your choice or a combination thereof. So you go through the process and you upload, you download the data from Facebook very easily through their process and they have, they're making it much more easy now. Then the data goes to the server. It is, it is stripped of any confidential medical identity as it goes into the server. That's part of the technology. It then is, uh, it is also created into a more structured process. And because we did that, it is now an, a personal asset of yours. It is as if Taylor Swift wrote a song. It is a story and that makes it copyrightable and a licensable asset, intellectual property. Okay, so if I do this, right, and I agree to licensing the, the story of my life, and that includes data that some, well, California and Europe deem personal data, even if it's not PII. That's my behavior data, things I did on Facebook, things I did on how I responded to the ads, uh, what are my brand affinities, what were my likes and dislikes, things like that. Created by me. Yeah. So, so if you had that, uh, then, of course, I still keep my rights. And the very instrument that gave you the opportunity, which is that Facebook had to comply, could be the same instrument that allows me to breach a contract because there couldn't be a contract that supersedes my privacy rights, meaning that I could always go... Uh, come back to you, you right? You can always, yeah, we have to follow the law. And the law says that at any time you can say, I rescind my license. I want you to delete my data. Oh, and do it now, now, now. And absolutely, we follow that, of course. So that means that you're doing something very interesting, which I tried to do myself a while ago without success, which is that you're propagating the exercise of rights to the brands that become your customers on the other end and that whenever a customer is asking for their data to be removed or modified or whatever, that you can ensure or the platform can ensure that that right is propagated. Yeah, absolutely. Because uh, then you would not be within the law. Yeah. And then we would not be serving the best interests of the consumers. You know, a lot of brands would say, well, well, I want exclusivity. I want this. I want that. And I'm like, no, that's illegal. You cannot restrain trade. I cannot prevent Sergio, if I really believe in his intellectual property, from licensing that data or taking it back. Now, um, it's a little bit different from a book because if I am an author and I create a book, right, it's my intellectual property, and I sell it to you, then uh, it's hard to take it back and say, no, you can't read my book anymore because it's already been read. The same thing in a way applies, not entirely, but it's similar to that, okay, I want my data back and the brand says, okay, then you're not getting the benefits. And that's okay. And that's okay. That's, those are decisions we want people to be able to make. We want brands to say, look, I, uh, I don't want this data anymore. So stop sending it to me or stop providing it for me over time. Uh, but I think there will be some uh, issues to be resolved. So I want data because it is so powerful, but also so dangerous yeah. to be regulated and controlled and I want it in the hands of ethical people. So speaking of, of ethics then, do you think that by doing this, people who can afford it will stay private because for $100 or $200 no, no. a year, it's not worth sacrificing no. their privacy? No, because it's not $100, $200 a year, Sergio. No. When you take seven free room nights at a luxury hotel, yeah. when you take free flights, when you take lowered interest rates from your bank, when you take bottles of wine, when you take free meals, when you take upgrades, upgrades, upgrades. I mean, right now I am a member of uh, the Bonvoy and I get the presidential suite every time I go. How much is that worth? How much is it worth to get free flights and upgrades? Suppose that someone ha happens to be low income, but they happen to also 
have a genetic code that could be a very good clue or a catalyst for, the, for, for solving some type of cancer. And 100 labs around the world want that genetic data. My question is, provocatively, should that person be compensated or should we just use them and abuse them as we do right now and pay them a pittance? And then I have the other question for you. If the genetic makeup of that individual was part of the solution and the, and the companies are now making billions of dollars off of that, should that poor individual perhaps have a small, tiny royalty stream for the rest of their lives? I would say yes, as long as we don't build the wrong incentive for people to start putting a price to data that could be very sensitive down the line. Well, privacy already has a price. We allow people to have bodyguards. We allow people to live in uh, uh, gated communities. What is that if not privacy? So there's a hypocrisy. But, but I will say this. I don't think that people understand that they're being hypocritical. I think that they're trying. So I welcome ideas from everywhere because it, I, I love to have my assumptions torture tested. And I can assure you, Sergio, that the Apex platform will have to evolve in order to meet new requirements and new ideas. And if we don't, we will die. So it's an evolutionary process. I believe that the majority of the people who are in this space are good people and they have good intentions, right? And so I think that the combination and recombination of those ideas, that's why I say it, it will be good that they be tested in court. Not because I think that the courts are the all knowing, uh, they have the perfect solution, but at least we'll have a stability, right? So now in America, you can drive 70, 80 miles an hour in highways. And that's only made, been made possible by some of the safeguards that we put into highways, into driving, into the technology of cars. So uh, my friend Julian Ranger at DigiMe always says that um, traffic laws, traffic regulations, tra you know, trans travel innovations have made it possible for people to go further and faster. I believe that all of these opinions and then regulations and innovations will make it much faster and much further for data to travel. I really believe in, in uh, exponential growth. I always laugh when I watch Singularity University because their assumption is Google owns the data, Microsoft owns the data, Amazon owns the data. People are never, they're, 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 the, thing, they're the entity that have things done to them. They don't participate in the, in the economy, in this exponential world. Oh yeah, they get the benefits. Oh, but you better pay for that benefit. Well, no, we are saying, Yes, and the fuel of all of that, the root cause of that is humans, and they deserve to be able to have economic benefit from the raw material that they create. So at this point, the APX platform is based, I know it will evolve into many other data sets, right? But you're kicking it off with Facebook data. And yeah, and we'll have Google data and Amazon data very soon. It's for consumer goods and services purposes right now. Yeah. So something that we've been reflecting on uh, or I've been discussing with other people is how useful that really is, right? Meaning that, because we have seen, there's been so many people building stuff on, on top of your portability, right? It's thinking you can connect to that data, then let's do something. And there's two things coming out of this. One of them is data that was born out of the digital properties created by a particular company, in this case, Facebook or YouTube or whatever, that because they created this space and the interaction that you have with that space as an individual generates that data. Mm -hmm. So in a way, it's a sort of co-creation, right? That the data is born out of that interaction. And in a way, the digital property has been built so that the data can be collected. An example is the likes on Facebook. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So that data is meant to inform that process within Facebook. Uh -huh. How good do you think that data will be when you pull it out of its natural habitat? I think it's a good proxy for certain habits, perceptions, opinions, so do I think that this reflects the perfect world? No more than I think uh, this interview reflects everything that Milton thinks because Milton can't think fast enough 
to really process his own ideas. So uh, I believe that these are good proxies. I believe that the more accumulation of data we have, just like in medical, the more we have your diet, your real diet, not what you say you ate, but what you ate, and uh, all the other, let's say, more factual elements will create a much better model. But they're only models, right? They're not, they're not ultimate reality. So yeah. I think we can debate that. What I would tell you is that this is rocket fuel compared to the kerosene we're using right now. So there's, there's kerosene and you know, gasoline and you know, jet fuel. This is rocket fuel. So this takes us to a much higher level of predictability and therefore we can make better recommendations. I don't think we'll ever be perfect, but I think it increases our probability. That's all we can do. So I, I, I wonder myself, to be honest with you, I think that's a journey we have to take. My feeling whenever I query any of these tools, they don't seem to know us that well. Even Google, that's supposed to know everything about us. It's like they get it wrong so often. Oh, they get it wrong so often compared to what? Because right now, before that, we were just guessing, okay, when we were doing advertising and we were putting out new products and making inventory of a certain amount that we now have to throw as wild as waste. So my question is, compared to what? And then the second thing I would say was that there was a Pew PEW study done in the United States. Because I asked the data loosening guys exactly that question. The, the thing that I admire those guys, Brad Davis and Tim Moynihan, is that they thought it through before I did too. And they said, well, look, there's a Pew study that shows that 70, 74% of the people say that when they look at the data that Facebook has on them, that it's pretty accurate. Now that still leaves a quarter of the people saying this is not, but, and also having run CRM for a city as the first uh, global project for Citibank. And I ran Citibank Latin America's consumer bank CRM. We knew that our data was dirty. We knew that we didn't have good data hygiene, even though we were a bank. So I, I think the idea is to get closer and closer to predictability. Yeah. It yeah. is not, uh, it is not a certainty as a, an increasing probability. And I, and I think that over time, what we will do is with consumers will say, consumer, how much does this data reflect you? And they'll be auditing their own data. Some of them will still lie. But I think one of the answers is that we'll be checking, uh, we'll have the opportunity to have all that data checked by the individual and say, okay, that is true. That's not true. I'm not a Republican. I'm not a Democrat. I'm not an independent. I'm not, you know, I, that isn't my sexual preference, whatever. But, and hopefully because they trust, they will be able to correct those elements of the data. Okay. So within the data lucent platform, you're going to be, eventually data is going to be aggregated to turn it into insights so that yes. brands can access it in aggregate. Yes. I guess the main advantage that you would see compared to things like street bees and, and sort of new generation survey platforms is that you come with a data set already sort of pre-cooked, which is data that they export from Facebook. Okay, but you will be able to remember that brands are going to go directly to their customers and ask for data. So I can choose to be identified or non-identified. Oh. Right. So yeah. that we will be able, but also we'll be able to assign a number here and put a number there so that Sergio's CRM file will be able to take on attributes that we have derived from the data. So it's not. So it's really deduplicated. Correct. Correct. So there's, there's going to be an aggregate knowledge of the segment, but there's also a, because we, with the intent here ultimately is personalization. And I can only personalize if I know who you are and you trust me because I do want Ritz Carlton to know. I do want BMW to know I'm here. And do you remember that I'm allergic to onions and garlic, right? I want them to know. In fact, uh, Katie always reminds me that the theme of the four seasons is a uh, customer is show me, you know me, right? And so uh, we don't see any conflict with People knowing your information, they already do, by the way. Do you think they would share more because you give them an incentive that is separate from the service? Or do you think they would trust you more and tell you the truth even more if what they tell you is directly connected with the service and not the reward? I think that people like rewards. 
period. Hmm. Okay. More is more when it comes to rewards. Okay. Especially when you need them, especially if you're not, how many billionaires are there? Not many, a few thousand. So the rest of us really do need those rewards, but I'll give you a, a, a very concrete example. I don't mind that my, that the Ritz Carlton knows that my son's name is Tanner, that he is now 14. And when I used to go early days, I didn't mind that they knew that he liked chocolate milk because they put it in the refrigerator for him. And that then he liked apple juice and that they took pictures of Tanner to send me back his memories. I loved it. So, but then there are other mothers who say, I never want you to know my children's name, Ritz Carlton. So I think that will be up to the choice of the individual and let the games begin. You know, we all are different. I have many other paranoias, by the way. So <laughs> that's not one of them. But other people, we need to respect their concerns and their desires. And that's what I love about this. Okay, it's trust and verification. It isn't just trust. It's trust and verify. And then I learn about you, Sergio. And that's what personalization is. Your needs, your wants, your desires, your preferences. Milton, thank you very much. Do you have any books or any, I don't know, any articles, anything you would recommend for anyone to listen? You can tell me now, you can tell me later. I like the book, Prediction Machines. Yeah, That's a really good one. Okay. I would read that if I were a, an executive and maybe even a consumer. Uh, I love everything that Richard Witt, W-H-I-T-T, -T, writes at uh, GLIANET. Uh, he's a brilliant uh, thinker, writer, and humanist. Uh, but I would also say that um, Dr. Eng at Data Swift, she has some incredibly wonderful uh, video casts. And I like Interrupt. I mean, I still think what Tim Berners-Lee is doing, I mean, whenever I find someone who is a competitor, I want to learn from them. So I will tell you that, yeah. uh, and it will take all of us, people like you, Sarheel, who is a pioneer, to build this together. And the more we debate in a, in a constructive and ethical way, the better off we're all going to be. Many thanks, Milton. That's a great ending. Let's hope for the best. And that's it for today. You can find more on mastersofprivacy.com and everything else you may need to follow us or contact us is right there. Thank you for listening. <laughs>